Okay, let's dive into the Romantics and the Romantic movement in art. And one of the cool things about the Romantics is they are very much still with us. Uh, the Romantics inaugurated a kind of way of looking at the world that has is is so they they, they uh, accomplished that shift in ways of looking at things so profoundly that most of the things that they thought which were kind of outrageous at the time we just take for granted now just how things are and probably the main aspect of that is the primacy of emotion the idea that uh, how we feel validates the quality of our lives uh, and it sounds weird to say that right because for most of you guys, I say, you know, the, how we feel validates the quality of our lives, and everybody goes, yeah. <laughs> and, um, but that's not the only way of looking at the world. And uh, when the Romantics come along, they, they lean hard on that idea. And uh, so, and that's why we get this word romantic. We still use it to this day to mean uh, uh, feelings of, of, love, right? Feelings of intense passion. Uh, because that's the most intense passion that there is, right? The most intense emotions you can have are, are romantic love. But the word romantic, originally, when the ro romantics show up on the scene, means a lot more than that. And it, it means any kind of intense emotion is important. And the idea that a life is not lived well, if it is not a life that is strongly felt, uh, is is kind of a new idea at that time. And now, as I said, we pretty much take it for granted and we don't think people are crazy for jumping out of airplanes and, and you know, <laughs> climbing Everest and <laughs> uh, 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 living lives of serial uh, uh, romance, right, where, where uh, people chaotically uh, uh, stumbling into, you know, one intense love affair after another. Um, if you if you look at that on on the surface of it, if you look at it uh, objectively, not from the perspective of of you know the romantics and how they <laughs> change the world, it's a pretty crazy way to live, right? Um, how many relationships are broken and and and, and um, you know, fall apart for that very reason? Because because someone doesn't feel in love anymore. Uh, the, the idea that we should always feel in love is, is not an ancient idea. <laughs> it's a very new idea. And it begins with the romantics, this idea that we should always feel this way and that, and that the quality of a relationship is uh, to be judged solely on that criteria. How in love do the people involved feel? Uh, and so, you know, this is this is kind of the world the romantics uh, bring us, and um, we live in it to this very day. Um, and and at the same time, they bring about a kind of celebrity uh, artist person that it didn't exist in the world before the romantics. Really, um, the artist as a celebrity is something we take for granted now. But then it was revolutionary. Um, if you think about um, musicians, for instance, uh, the superstars of music prior to the Romantics were the composers, not the musicians. Uh, an orchestra is simply a, a collection of professional musicians there to play the instruments to, to uh, embody the composer's vision. But the composer's the superstar. People go to see um, you know Mozart, not to see the individual people playing Mozart, uh, but with the Romantics that changes, and the and the the artist becomes themselves a celebrity with all of the things that we associate with celebrity to this to this day, fame and fortune and wild crazy lives, <laughs> um, uh, short lives many of them, um, drugs right. <laughs> Uh, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll was invented by the Romantics, and so um, this is uh, you know, this is what they bring to the world. Remember, I, I, let's say probably every lecture, right? We know when things start; we never see them end. Well, that's when this starts, and 
I've got several examples of this, some some essays and some different things I've thrown out there in the in the course content for you about the Romantics and and their lives and uh, what they have you know brought us. Um, uh, so you know, take a look at that, and uh, I'll have a assignment up over that as well. It, 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 I'll, I'll put that up tonight. Um, but I want to shift gears just a bit and talk about Na the rise of Napoleon Bonaparte because he is part of this moment in history uh, when the Romantic uh, movement and art really gets going. And um, Napoleon is himself a new kind of person in the world. Uh, no one like him exists in world history until he shows up on the scene. And we've seen several like him since Napoleon came along. But there was no one like him before. And that's true. Basically, it's an astonishing thing to say, but it's absolutely true of world history. Um, look, every world leader, every person who rose to the level of an emperor in the world uh, prior to Napoleon comes from some sort of royalty, some kind of birthright that uh, puts them in a position in life where they can assume that role. Even Alexander the Great, who is probably as close to Napoleon as you can get in the ancient world, he still came from one of the major ruling families in Greece. He was not a shepherd. Uh, <laughs> He was he was somebody in Greek culture, in a in a position of power and authority before he got started. Napoleon Bonaparte is different, and the circumstances in which Napoleon arrives uh, are also unique circumstances in world history. Nothing like this really exists, and so we got to go just a little bit of of, of, of broad brushstroke history here about the the two revolutions that take place in this time. You have the American Revolution, which happens obviously over here, uh, and it is a revolution of aristocrats against a king. So enlightenment figures, right? people who we've been looking at studying, these are, these are heavy hitters in the world of thought and ideas, and they're all fabulously rich. Um, and most of them own slaves, by the way, which is a thing we're gonna talk about a bit uh, as we go forward. Um, and they rebel against a king who's an ocean away, uh, beat his army on her own soil and some mercenaries they bring against us, and, and they inaugurate a stable democracy based on these enlightenment ideas. Um, and it works. It works fabulously well. The French kind of follow suit, but their revolution is a revolution of peasants against aristocrats. It is an uprising of the mob against these uh, fabulously wealthy, unbelievably out of touch um, aristocrats in France. And um, it ends up in complete chaos. Nothing is stable about it. They have no firm idea of what they want to do. Uh, the, the aftermath of the French Revolution is one of incredible chaos and violence. Um, the whole thing just starts to fall apart immediately as you know they've overthrown you know the, the rulers and now the people are in charge what are we going to do well they formed several different governments several different forms of democracy several different ideas that none of which could get along with one another it was a constant upheaval and a constant, you know, fighting and infighting with one another, and and while this is going on, everyone's suffering. The French, the French, you know, social system has basically ceased to function, and in this environment, the royalists, the people who are like, wait a minute, we had it better before. <laughs> the people who were on the side of the monarchy and the aristocracy uh, try to pony up their own forces and take back control, and uh, in this chaos. Uh, a guy named Napoleon Bonaparte happens to be in the right place at the right time. A royalist mob is marching on Paris, and the Par government in Paris is paralyzed. They are, they are about to get overrun by the royalists. Um, there's chaos in the streets, there's panic, and there happens to be an Italian, Napoleon's not even French, 
He's from Italy. He's a Corsican. Um, he's an artillery officer. That's all he is. He's a guy who is in charge of cannons. And he happens to be there at the you know, central square in, in Paris where this, this mob is converging. And, and he says, listen, I can help you guys out. I can solve your problem here. And typical of Napoleon, he says, I will only help you if you agree to do exactly what I say, give me absolute power in this circumstance. And they say, okay. So he lines up cannons on all the approaches to the plaza and fills them with grape shot, uh, which basically turns a cannon into a giant shotgun. He fills cannons with 60 caliber uh, musket balls. And when the crowd arrives, he mows them down. And that is how he begins to come into prominence. And in the chaos and anarchy of the French Revolution, Napoleon finds a place where he can rise to power. And he does so with astonishing speed. And so from the time, all, not just because he's just the right, you know, in the right place at the right time, but there's a great deal of that involved here. But he also happens to be a genius. He happens to be a, a, a military genius, a tactical genius. Um, he, he, you know, the world had not seen a military mind quite like his since Hannibal. And, um, but he's also a particular kind of individual. He's utterly ruthless, completely unmoored from normal considerations of morality. Uh, he's a person for whom uh, good and bad don't exist. Or I should say for whom right and wrong don't exist. There's only good and bad for me and what I'm trying to accomplish. Uh, and in the space of about 10 years from the incident in the square where he shoots everybody with the cannons to him becoming basically the ruler of all of Europe is a space of about 10 years. So a person goes from nobody to the emperor of Europe in a decade and nothing like that had ever happened in human history. Uh, now, the people who follow in his footsteps are named uh, Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin. Um, as far as <laughs> from nobody to, to, to ruler of, of you know, large swaths of the world and trying to conquer the world. And make no mistake, Napoleon did try to conquer the world. The Napoleonic World's wars were really the first world war. Uh, the fight between uh, Napoleon and, and Great Britain, which was the only country still holding out after a while, um, was a fight that took place all over the planet. Uh, and uh, wherever those true empires could project power, they were fighting with one another. And they were enlisting every ally they could possibly get on either side of that conflict. Uh, but the Romantics loved Napoleon. They absolutely adored him. Um, and this kind of begins a, a history of, of these kinds of, of transgressive, creative artists um, adoring what are essentially fascist leaders, right? Um, Hitler was very popular amongst artists in the early days of his, of his rise to power. Uh, and they saw in, in Napoleon, the Romantics, a kindred spirit, someone who was stepping outside of the normal bounds of society and making his own way and doing his own thing and, and rising to this, uh, this place of enormous prominence based on his own talents and his own abilities. And so the Romantics were like, yeah, we're, we're all about that. Um, but I want, to, I want to point out that I've given you a picture in a painting. It's a famous Romantic painting in the Romantic spirit. Right? Lots of emotion happening in this painting. If you look at it in your, in your um, course content, it shows Napoleon visiting his soldiers who are dying of the plague. This incident happens during Napoleon's um, Egyptian campaign. He decides to conquer North Africa. And uh, he does all kinds of, of insane things, but very, very Napoleonic things to do so. One of the things he does is he publicly converts to Islam to uh, enlist allies amongst the Islamic people. Um, 
and he he you know engages in this 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 land campaign in uh, Egypt, but uh, there's a battle, a, a sea battle at the mouth of the Nile, where uh, Admiral Nelson and the British fleet uh, destroy Napoleon's way home. <laughs> they just wipe out his ships that are sitting there at the mouth of the Nile. And Napoleon is stuck having to march out of Egypt. And in this circumstance, his soldiers begin to get sick and die. And they have the plague. And, and the plague is, you know, <laughs> ever since the Middle Ages, right? The plague is not a good thing to have in a large group of people. And this, this painting commemorates a moment where Napoleon personally visits his soldiers who are sick with the plague. Uh, and as you can see in the picture, it's a very idealized kind of moment. Here's the great leader, you know, sharing the dangers of the plague by visiting his soldiers who are dying and sick. Um, but what the painting doesn't show you is what happened immediately after that. Napoleon left the building and ordered every single one of those soldiers killed. He had them poisoned. Because you just can't have the plague if you're trying to march out of Egypt. And that's very typical of Napoleon, <laughs> very, very typical uh, action of his to do something like that. Um, and it's interesting that um, the romantic uh, artists and poets who, who idolized him um, never really saw that side of him in so, to, to a large degree, right? That, that <laughs> there's a dark side to this kind of individual and it just gets worse, right? Nap uh, when Hitler comes along, he's Napoleon, uh, uh, writ large, right? Napoleon only worse. Uh, and so you know, this kind of person arises in the world and uh, we've been, we have been troubled by that individual ever since. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a thing. Um, and, uh, you know, we got to watch out. <laughs> watch out for these people. This could happen again. Um, and so, you know, history does tend to repeat itself and why these, these kinds of people arise and why they feel it uh, incumbent on themselves to take over the world is beyond me, but it certainly happens. Uh, and that's a, it's a curious thing about human beings. Another thing that about us that's odd, that bears some, some contemplation, some thought, right? Why is it? That when someone has a good idea, and Napoleon had a good idea, right? He, he came into the chaos of the, of the aftermath of the French Revolution and immediately imposed order. Immediately things got better, Im immensely better, so much better that, that France went from a chaotic laughingstock uh, to the most powerful nation on earth in about a decade, right? It was quick, the turnaround, because Napoleon was on the scene you know, restoring order to things. But his next impulse was to export that order to the rest of the world by force, uh, to, to impose his kind of neoclassical vision on, on uh, his, his, his uh, autocratic dictatorial rule and order on the rest of the planet. Uh, everywhere he could reach, he could project enough force to do so. And I wonder about that, right? Why, 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 can't, why, why can't Napoleon Bonaparte fix France and say, great, I fixed France, this is great. Look at what I did. And live happily ever after. <laughs> What's, why is the next step always conquer the world? Um, it's an impulse in human beings that is just part of how we, who we are, and, and, and I don't, I really don't understand it. Um, your discussion question is going to be about that. Help me understand this, right? Why does this happen? You know, Hitler shows up in Germany and it's a disaster and the aftermath of World War I is horrific. People who were upper middle class German citizens are literally starving to death in the streets of Berlin when Hitler comes to power and he fixes it. He imposes order. He, he, he takes Germany from a chaotic laughingstock to one of the most powerful nations on earth in a, in a blink of an eye and immediately decides to take over the world. 
<laughs> Why couldn't he stop while he was ahead? What's that all about? <laughs> I don't get it, right? Um, there's a madness in these people. There's an insanity. There's a there's an illness. There's something wrong here, um, and it's but it is a a typical um, universal aspect of the human condition. Uh, so uh, let's think a little bit about that in our discussion question. 